the wonder of new life and new mothers is probably the last thing that comes to mind when you think of Nazi Germany. But that regime saw its own next generation as a top priority, and it used some of its trademark brutality to try to secure the kind of births it wanted. Beverly Chalmers' book, Birth, Sex, and Abuse, Women's Voices Under Nazi Rule, recounts this often hidden history, and she's with us tonight. Welcome. Thank you. It was really tough to read this, but very necessary. Um, how did the Nazis begin to manipulate pregnancy and birth? Um, it's their, their program of the manipulation of pregnancy and birth to achieve their, their creation of a master race began right from the beginning um, of their, their reign in 1933. One of the first things they did was to implement a program of sterilization of women who did not meet the appropriate um, Aryan credentials. What the, credentials were those? Basically, the image we have of the, the tall, blonde, blue-eyed, beautiful, Aryan, German women, a Nordic image, as they called it. Mm -hmm. And anyone who did not meet those criteria was not regarded as appropriate and perhaps eventually became regarded as unworthy of life. Um, it started with people with severe illnesses, mental illnesses, um, inherited genetic disorders, but it expanded to people who were behaviorally um, not work, work shy, as what they call them, weren't mm -hmm. good workers, weren't perhaps uh, prostitutes in the society. Um, and these two became unacceptable and unworthy of life, a burden on society. So the initial program was to, to sterilize all of these women, and included in that was German were, were Jewish women, but it was a, applied to all German women. Um, that then later developed into mm -hmm. the euthanasia program, where those regarded as unworthy of life were actually euthanized, killed, murdered. Um, and that program became directed towards Jewish women in particular, all Jewish women and people in that category that were unacceptable. It included also uh, the gypsies, um, homosexuals. So it expanded, but the primary target was Jewish women. And if you were a pregnant woman or a mother with a child when you arrived at the concentration camps, uh, what was most likely to happen to you once you got off a cattle car? The primary target on arrival at the camps was the elimination, the murder of Jewish pregnant women and young children. There was no question they were automatically sent to the gas in, in the extermination centers. And from the time that they arrived um, to the camps, how did the Nazis go about, I guess, taking apart a woman's femininity? Oh, this was a whole process of dehumanization, mm -hmm. um, and it made it easier to kill them. Um, they were shaved. They, those who survived, the young women who did survive, um, were shaved. They were um, tattooed. They had their clothing removed. They were forced to be naked in many situations and to run naked. Um, they were not given names. Their identity was removed. Um, they were kept in filth and dirt conditions. Um, unhealthy, terrible sanitary conditions like the latrines were, were atrocious. Um, they dehumanized them. They became not people anymore, not human. Um, they became what they call subhumans. And then eventually they became called just figures. We can get rid of these figures. And because they were so filthy and, and un unkempt, um, they were regarded as garbage, as vermin, which fitted the whole ideology um, image that had been created over the, the last 10 years before the camps were established mm -hmm. um, about how the Jews were uh, an unwelcome, unwanted, burdensome, infectious mm -hmm. component of society. And that simply made it easier for the Nazis and the SS and the Germans to impose the, the, the final solution on them and to murder them all. Women in concentration camps, um, were they more supportive and nurturing to one another than the men? This is an image that was created in the early years of writing about women in the Holocaust, that they were so-called camp sisters who looked after each other and made it easier to survive. But it's not altogether true. And the later feminist writers actually recanted that. Mm -hmm. um, women were, some women were very supportive and did have groups, and, and their survival did depend on them. Others were very independent. But those kind of groups also existed amongst men. Men were very supportive of each other, too. And many would not have survived if they hadn't um, had someone to, to help them and, and, and save them in situations. So it's a bit of a myth. And so the, there wasn't any friction between the women or the men, no competition? Yes. Well, not between women and men, because women and men were usually separated. Mm -hmm. in but within camps. women and women or men and men? Yes. 
And if you think about it, women were, were reduced to absolute starvation. There was nothing. They were, they, they, a, a half a scrap of bread might have kept them alive another day. And when you reduce to that level of survival instinct, uh, you become nasty. You, be, you will fight for, you, for that piece of bread. You will actually steal from others. You will fight them physically. You will um, try to push them away from, from the food that's available. Mm -hmm. You'll steal their shoes. You'll steal their bread if they don't eat it immediately and leave it overnight. People, and men and women, were reduced to, to horrific acts they were of trying cruelty to survive. in order to survive. But it's not, we need to be careful that we don't blame the women. Mm -hmm. We nearly, really need to blame the Nazis and the Germans who forced the situation on them and, and made them into this kind of animal, as some people have said, we, we were turned into animals. Um, although animals are not so cruel necessarily. But it's not the, the women that we ought to despise. It's those who imp impose this, these horrific conditions on women in the camps that force them into these unpleasant behaviors. Did women give birth in the concentration camps? A few did. Um, some managed to, especially those towards the end of the war who, who managed to survive at least, um, they would be admitted to the camps in early pregnancy, which wouldn't be picked up at the selections. And they did continue and did give birth in the camps. It usually was a death sentence for both the mother and the baby. Um, there were a few doctors who were wonderful, prisoner doctors, who perhaps did things which today we would condemn, like aborting all the women who were pregnant so that at least the mothers could live. Mm -hmm. Um, and that did happen, or they murdered the babies immediately they were, they were born. The infanticide was practiced in order to save the lives of the mother. Um, so these things did happen, but very few babies were really born in the camps. And the only ones that survived were really those that um, were born right at the end of the war as the camps were liberated, and they might have survived. Um, here's some testimony you quoted from camp survivor Philippe Mueller. And, um, you're right. The main motives for seeking these relationships with women was not so much sexual, but simply the need to have someone to care for. All family ties had been forcibly and abruptly severed, and it was this feeling of desolation, of being utterly alone in the world, which awoke in almost everyone the longing to have someone to care for. Relationships happened in concentration camps. Were they more, did they? Yes, they did. Uh, were they based on sex or were they more platonic? Um, well, they, they occurred both in ghettos and in camps. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they were, they were forced to be platonic because women, women and men were separated by fences. So they might have fallen in love with the girl that they could see across the, across the way. Um, some were able to have contact with each other and they were love relationships. Some of those, a few actually even survived the war and married and lived after, uh, happily afterwards. But very, very few did. For most of the time, sex did occur, and even in Auschwitz and some of the worst camps. Was it camps. consensual? Or? Um, consensual is a difficult word in this, in this situation because women were starving, and perhaps one of the only ways to get a little bit of extra food was to agree to have sex with uh, the workers who might have come in. Um, and they, there were men who came in to, to fix things in the women's camps. Mm -hmm. And these men um, often, or when it was possible, did ex have what we call sexual exchange. Now, was it consensual? Yes, because it was an exchange. It was, a, I, I have to get that food or whatever that the man could offer. In an exchange, I could only offer my, my body. So, but it was not consensual in the sense that we know today. It's not a loving relationship in the slightest. It was abusive by any manner or means. Um, and yet, even though the Nazis considered Jews impure, there is widespread evidence in your book uh, they raped and sexually exploited Jewish women in these camps. Um, how did their philosophy justify mm -hmm. that? Nazi ideology and Nazi philosophy is often full of, of uh, incongruous behaviors like this. Mm -hmm. um, Ras and Shanda, the, the, the racial shame of having, uh, was forbidden uh, to, to engage in sexual contact with Jewish women. And in the camps, it was uh, less likely to happen. Mm -hmm. But in the villages where the actions took place to arrest um, Jewish women, such as with the Einsatz group and the groups that went into the, the Soviet Union as part of the, the, the front of the German army, um, they came across Jewish women in villages who looked no different from anybody else. They were dressed the same way, they looked, they were healthy, they were just living as ordinary villagers. Mm -hmm. And those Jewish women were frequently abused uh, and used as sexual objects. Um, and of course, they had to be killed. 
in case they live to tell the tale, because then the German army man or whoever would, would uh, be reported and perhaps be in some kind of trouble. So the easiest way was to use them, abuse them, and kill them. So while the Nazis suppressed the reproduction of Jews, uh, they promoted the lives they saw as valuable. Yes. You write that reproduction was held not to be a private matter, but a sacred duty to ensure a racially valuable reservoir of good blood to lead Germany into the future. How did the Nazis manipulate the reproductive lives of so-called Aryan women? Okay, the whole Nazi ideology was to create a master race, this perfect German race. And in order to do that, they had to eliminate those that were unworthy of life, but also promote those, uh, the births of women who met their perfect ideals. Um, so German Aryan women were encouraged to have babies. They were given uh, incentives of marriage loans, um, they were given medals for more, the more babies they had. Is that the Lebensborn program? That was, that a, it was only a part of it. This, they, these rules, these encouragements that I'm talking about apply to all German society. Mm -hmm. um, the Lebensborn program was a more specific program where um, they created, it was Himmler who created um, a special centers for the wives of SS women who were purely Aryan um, to give birth and have good care. But it was also a place where the women who were unmarried and were having so-called approved babies, pure babies, could go and give birth without shame. And where they would be looked after and the babies would be looked after and either kept by the mother or adopted by good SS families. Um, because Lebensborn served as an adoption service as well. Um, so the Lebensborn program was really designed to encourage birth even amongst the unmarried women. And there was always that image of, you know, you have to give birth, have a baby for the Fuhrer. And this mm. was one of the, the stories that, that remains about what happened at the time. Uh, what was the German mother's honor cross? Um, these were medals that were given to women who had more and more babies. Mm -hmm. Four, six, eight babies were given more and more valuable crosses. And this meant that those women were respected. They had to be saluted in the, if they wore their medals in the streets. They had priority at shopping centers and things like that. And a mother who had 10 babies was given ten, ten babies was given the honor, um, and I put that in inverted commas, mm -hmm. of having Adolf Hitler as the godfather of that child. And if it was a boy, that child was usually named Adolf. So these were honors that were held out as incentives mm -hmm. for German women to have more and more babies. I want to talk about the role the medical and scientific community played in all of this. Mm -hmm. In your book, you quote Dr. Arthur Gut, a firm believer in eugenics, and he wrote, love of one's fellow man had to disappear, especially in regard to inferior and asocial elements, and that it was the supreme duty of a state to allow life and sustenance only to that part of the nation, which was sound and free from hereditary taint, in order to secure the continuance of a racially pure people free from hereditary taint for all eternity. This was published in 1935. To what extent did research like this legitimize the ultimate genocide to come? It was a huge part of Nazi ideology. Um, and it was, the, the, the Nazi genocide is, is fairly unique in that it was um, implemented by many, many levels of society and including the intelligentsia, the medical profession, the legal profession. It had the backing of, of what we would regard today as the most civil, one of the most civilized societies of the world at, at the time. Um, and that is, is fairly unique and very frightening because it does mean that people like ourselves, mm -hmm. perhaps, if exposed to the kind of propaganda which was massive and incredibly influential and powerful, um, could go down the same route. And this is why it's so important that we actually read what really happened, read the true stories, even though they're very difficult to, to face, and understand what really happened at that time so that we can guard against it happening again. Where was the, I'm curious to know, was the German medical and scientific community, were they willing in manipulating the reproductive lives of women? Yes, it appears that hundreds of doctors were actually involved in the uh, sterilization program in the euthanasia program. And of course, doctors were the ones who did this. Doctors did the sterilizations. Doctors did the euthanasia. Don't, they, do, don't physicians have to take the Hippocratic Oath? 
Uh, yes, but you know, this was we shall do no harm. But these are not harm. This is these are vermin. This is this is purifying the, the race. We are actually doing something very honourable. Mm -hmm. And those doctors, many of the doctors who were tried after the war in the Nuremberg trials, there was a special trial of the doctors, and those doctors expressed virtually no guilt, no shame about what they'd done. In fact, they said. Um, Please, won't you give me paper in my cell, so that in my jail cell, so that I can record my my findings from my research, which was just so valuable and important for the world. We have done something wonderful for for society, and it should be documented. Were there any doc so there were no doctors that spoke out against it? Not many, um, very few, in fact. There were some who especially early in the year, saw it coming and, and wrote about it. And they ended up being terminally killed as well. And one in particular that I quote in the book was killed in Theresienstadt. He did talk about it. Um, and it, unfortunately, many of the doctors went along with it. Not surprisingly, because the German propaganda campaign was enormous. And the Nazis integrated all the professions, all the medical professionals in Germany at the time into one association and forced them into studying what they called uh, racial science, Rassenkunde, and they forced them into studying this. Um, all of them were exposed to it, and uh, they became very imbued with this philosophy, this ideology of how wonderful it is to have a pure race of people. And they carried out lots of experiments. What yes. were some of the experiences that they conducted? Oh, many of the experiments were, were horrific, um, designed either to, to uh, provide survival for German army, like survival in very high altitudes or in very cold temperatures. But the ones that interested me most were the ones that were directed towards reproduction. And um, they sterilized women. They tried out, tried out various methods of sterilization um, for men and women um, and implemented the most horrific experiments on twins to see if they could um, reproduce blonde, blue-eyed, yes. They, there is some suggestion that they did force twins to uh, mate with each other in the hope that they might um, uh, create more twins, which would, of course, be a very rapid way of, of generating a beautiful race if you could find out how to make people have twins more often. Remember, this is in the days before in vitro fertilization and so on. Um, so there were horrific experiments just, uh, just, uh, performed on children, on twins. Um, could we change eye color to be blue? How do we uh, create this, this beautiful master race? Um, and how do we uh, sterilize men and women as fast as we could in, in the most efficient way so that we could use those people to work but not to reproduce? And to the people that were being experimented on, did they know what was being done to them? Did they give consent? Like no, no such thing as consent. Mm -hmm. um, most of them did not know. Even if they had surgery, they didn't know what was done on with them found out many years later that perhaps a uterus had been removed or horrific things like that. Um, and it's in fact because of the medical experiments that happened during the Nazi era that the whole field of medical ethics in research developed and became such a, a strong, powerful influence on our research programs and how we conduct research today. If you have to find something good that came out of the Holocaust, this was one of them, but they're few. Um, obviously, both Jewish and non-Jewish women suffered heavily at the hands of the Nazis, but the abuse was completely different in nature. Um, is it really fair to call both of these groups victims? There is no equivalency in what happened to Jewish women and what happened to German women who met racial criteria, or even those who did not. Um, having to have more babies than you might have wanted, um, or even being sterilized unwantedly, um, was far better as an outcome than being murdered. Jewish women had no choice. They had no way to escape it. They were just murdered because they were Jewish. And German women who had to have more babies than they would liked and were given great honor and and, and uh, they were pride, celebrated. they were celebrated for it. Mm -hmm. You, They were victims in that sense, mm -hmm. but it's not nearly as bad a consequence as what happened with the Jewish women. The book is full of, of atrocities. Mm -hmm. um, many of which are just too graphic for us to explain to our viewers mm -hmm. today. Were there ever moments when you were just too disturbed and had to stop? Oh, yes. <laughs> many, many, many. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard reading all this time. And I can only tell you what, how I used to. I used to read it to myself, and I, I read nothing but Holocaust books for a dozen years. How many and, books do you think you read? Oh, um, 
I quote about four, five hundred in the book itself, and there are about two thousand uh, references to footnotes in the book. It is very, very uh, clearly documented and mm -hmm. supported by by literature. Um, but when I used to read these things, especially my bedside reading, going to bed, I'd read some of these most horrific stories, and I couldn't keep it to myself anymore. And I bumped my husband and said, you've got to hear this, I can't believe they actually did this. And then I'd read him the most terrible anecdotes of what, it, what actually happened to these women. And then I'd leave him to go to sleep with his nightmares and me with mine. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult reading. You spent a decade working mm -hmm. on this. What did you think you've learned about humanity, what humanity mm -hmm. is capable of? It's a hard one. Um, while I live surrounded by people who are very loving and very wonderful, and we live in a good country that does try to do very good things all the time, I am aware that I belong to a race. As Patrick, Father Patrick Desbois says, and it's my last quote in the book, um, he, as he says, I belong to a race that kills two-year-old children. And I cannot avoid that. I have to identify and agree with him that that is the case. And we only have to look around us today to see what's happening. Um, there have been multiple genocides since the Holocaust. Um, there have been horrors in the Congo, in Darfur, um, in Rwanda, mm -hmm. um, Cambodia. We, we see it all around us. And if we just take our blinkers off and we actually look, we see people doing horrific things to each other all the time. And I have to accept that I belong to a people that can do this, just as happened in a most sophisticated, respected country of Europe, Germany at the time of how the do we, How do we eradicate this? I believe that by becoming more aware of what actually happened, by reading the stories of women that make it come alive so that we know what really happened to women, it's the only way we can become aware of what happened, try to understand it, try to see in that the messages of watching in our society of when these warning signs begin to appear as to what might be developing in our society, when people get carried away by ideological extremism, and I include in that religious, not one religion, but a number of religions, mm -hmm. and I don't talk about spirituality, people who are deeply religious of, are, are good people, but people who are extreme and who begin to say our religion is right and is better and we impose that on anyone else and there are consequences if you don't follow us. Mm -hmm. That kind of extreme ideological um, belief system is a danger in our world today. And I see this happening around us all the time and it's something we have to fear and guard against. What motivated you to write this book? Oh, I've spent my life working on women giving birth in difficult situations, different political or social or economic situations. And this became another um, example of perhaps one of the worst situations in which women were faced to, to, to had to give birth in. And I just became overwhelmingly passionate about reading about this. I realized that it, is, it was a story that hadn't been told. The stories of giving birth, the reproduction, the sexual lives of women in the Holocaust is a story that has never been put together. And I believe we owed it to those women to tell their stories. Why do you think that is, that it hasn't been put together before? Um, I think it's been too hard to face. Um, I think also that the initial decades after the war, we focused on Jews as a whole, as the worst victims of, of the Holocaust. Um, we didn't separate it into men and women. Um, and it's only in the late 1980s or so that we started looking at women's experiences of the war. And even then, it was harder to talk about women's experiences of sexual behavior or of reproductive behavior. And women themselves were unwilling to talk about it. It's, mm -hmm. it, it's a very sensitive area. And even the testimonies that were given um, in later years, in the 70s and 80s, were designed for families to read, for children to learn about. And so women would not have talked about very intimate experiences like sexual rape and exchange. Um, and those stories became hidden, and it's been hard to find them. I had to go right back to the stories that were written by women during the time, the few that have survived in diaries, and those that were written immediately after the war, where women were more forthcoming and mm -hmm. outright about what actually had happened to them. But it became lost in the, the history of, of research in this field until now. Do you think it has to do with the fact that it had to do with women? Well, I think in the sense that, you know, th there was a need for the feminist revolution, right? Mm -hmm. and, and women have had to fight to have their voices heard. And I think that was part of the story. Um, but I think it was more that it was just an area of, of 
discussion that was not easily talked about. Um, women who grew up and lived through the Holocaust came from a very modest society. Discussion about sexuality was not part of life. It was not acceptable. Um, women were ignorant about childbirth or sexual behavior until very late into adolescent and adulthood and didn't talk about it, even perhaps to their husbands. Mm -hmm. So um, it was hard for them to talk about it. So I think this is part of the reason why these areas have been, have been neglected and not brought to the forefront until today when we are more open about sexuality today. And you said you were inspired to do this by your daughter. Yes. Um, I have an amazing daughter who is one of my three daughters. They're mm -hmm. all amazing. But um, this particular child was at, at the age of 11. She read a Holocaust story. And it was about a child who's watched her parents being killed in front of her. And when the, my daughter got to that point, she put it aside. She couldn't read it anymore. And she said, that could have been me, and I, I don't want to know about it. And a few days later, she went back and picked up the book and read it again. And years later, I said to her, why? What happened? And she said, well, I realized that that little girl um, had no choice. She lived through it. She watched these things happening. She survived. And she had the courage to go back and tell her story, which I thought, I need to honor her memory by reading it. And that inspired me as well. Um, and it makes me realize that if she had the courage, if, if these women had the courage to write their stories, to tell them, we owe it to these women to honor them by reading them and to, to learn from them and use their stories to make sure that this kind of thing never happens again. Thank you very much for being here, Beverly. Thank you for having me. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.